Thank you for staying with us. Now, we have Kabir joining us via Skype. Kabir Adamu, are you there? Yes, now, I he, am. He can is the me? managing, yeah, I can hear you. He's the managing director of Beacon Consulting Limited, a renowned firm providing enterprise risk and security management solutions in Nigeria and the Sahel. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's my pleasure to be with you. All right, so have you been listening to our conversation um, about the lockdown and yes. security threats? Yes, I have. So would you like to start from there? What do you think is happening um, and how are you assessing the situation? Yes, um, as I've always um, maintained, it is not appropriate to have the military deployed in um, a democratic setting like ours. It should be, first and foremost, the responsibility of the police. Um, when you deploy the military for civil matters, the type of issues that we have seen uh, in, in Delta, as an example, are the types of issues that we'll see, um, especially when we do not spell out in clear terms the, the terms of reference, the rules of engagement, the standard operating procedures for managing the kind of situation they will encounter, then we leave it to their whims and cap caprices. And because we have different people, the different people respond to different situations. Unfortunately, the psychological tool of COVID-19 has been quite heavy on virtually every Nigerian. I'm going through it, you are going through it, every Nigerian, the military, personnel who are going, going through it. So how they respond to these situations is also a function of the kind of psychological um, you know, the support they get from their various organizations. Now, I'm, I've been very uh, watchful to hear or see whether the rules of engagement, the standard operating procedures for their engagement with the civil populace will be reeled out. Unfortunately, I've not had that till date. So um, it appears that they were just sent out there, perhaps with a bit of briefing, but without proper and well thought out rules of engagement and standard operating procedures. And that's why we're seeing the kind of things we're seeing. Unfortunately, um, except if something is done regarding these standard operating procedures and rules of engagement, then we're going to see more of that, unfortunately. Okay. Okay. Okay, my name is Lami. Okay, uh, my name okay. is Lami and I'm going to ask you this. Um, Recently, the borders have been shut, the land and air borders have been shut, and we know that part of the problems we have with terrorism has been the porous borders of Nigeria. Now that the borders are partially or completely shut, do you think this will then go a long way in assisting against the war against um, insurgency in the Middle East? I'm sorry. North. Yeah. In the Northeast. Um, let us be realistic. When we, when the authorities say the borders have been shot, are they talking about the formal borders? Um, we're aware that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of informal borders that are not in any way regulated, um, especially given our circumstances in Africa. If you go to parts of um, the South, South, as well as parts of even, to an extent, Lagos State, um, and then, of course, the, the North, um, we're talking about the northeast, the border area between Nigeria and Cameroon, the border area between Nigeria and Niger, and the border area between Nigeria and Chad. A lot of these are informal borders. You have communities that are subsisting side by side, that are more, more or less speaking the same language, going to the same market, and movement between those borders is largely unregulated. So when we say the borders are closed, um, I'm a bit hesitant really to go with that, that idea. I know there, is, there was an operation before uh, the you know, COVID-19 um, pandemic came on board. And then, of course, the, the government said it had shut down the border. But I can bet you that till today, there is movement across our borders that, I, that is not documented. Um, to answer your question, yes, um, to an extent, if we look at the um, water bodies, especially the sea borders, and then, of course, the air um, borders, the, the airports and all that, regulation is ongoing very, very well. So because they've been shot, movement of um, Ill illicit and illegal weapons and other uh, kind of, um, you know, uh, 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 weapons or equipment that we, we don't want into our country has been stopped. But for those informal borders that I spoke about, unfortunately, till date, there has been no measure that has been put in place by government to ensure that last year we were told that um, huge sums of money, if I remember well, about 50 something billion US dollars was passed for e uh, borders in Nigeria. We've not heard how that money is going to be implemented. If that is implemented, then perhaps these informal borders that I'm talking about would be re regulated. 
Okay, sorry to interrupt you. In one minute, what do you think would be the quick solution? If because we, we we heard or we read about Chad, what they did, you know, with with um, Boko Haram insurgency. What would you think the quick solution would be to take advantage of the lockdown, you know, in in tackling insurgency? Because we hear there are still some pockets of attacks here and there in the north. Um, the solution is in our hands. Um, the multinational joint tax force that was set up in 2014 um, is really the, the way to go. If all the countries come together like they're doing right now, then we will see the results. Um, they, are, they, are, they are taking the war to the basis of um, the, the two major groups um, that are active, the Jamaat al 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 on these three locations that I've mentioned. It is only now that there is an attempt, especially since the Chadians got angry. Um, you recall they killed about 100 of their soldiers. The, the president, Idris Davy, came out to say he's going to carry out a major offensive, and then we're seeing that offensive. Now, my point is, take the war to the basis of this two major groups and it will end okay. the insurgency. Thank you so much, Mr. Kavri. We would have to let you go now. Thank you so much for being part of the show. We'll talk to you very you. soon. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so you heard um, a few pockets of the conversations of what we're having with um, Mr. Kavri. I'll be every pocket. <laughs> Um, but first, before we come to Mr. Kabir, people are attacking you on the on on, on WhatsApp. Joy says, okay. "I disagree with your guest. The police have um, have funding issues. Look at the average policeman on the road. Standards of uh, work tools. There, the there are most there are most uh, there must be adequate training and retraining. That's from from Joy. Hamed says, um, "Have we looked at the state of the stations? How much are the police paid?" What welfare package do they have for themselves and their families? And what um, Lola is saying, what is the current training state for the police force? I think all those are lumped together. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah according to Joy, I, I never disagreed about the underfunding the funding, of the yeah. police. Uh, but I say that is not the major factor why the police are failing. Okay. You understand? Uh, when you go into our statistics, uh, you discover that billions of uh, Nera are being uh, dispensed for the Nigerian police. Why is it channeled? Yeah, 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 so uh, uh, people need to be held accountable where this, those money are going to. Yeah. Like if you go to, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, 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 the police uh, CID, the one in Yaba, uh, for example, uh, you, you discover that there are more than 20 generators inside there. And each time I visit that station, I will just presume maybe I'm in the war front or maybe Boko Haram are attacking because of the various sound of generator in that place. And all the uh, police officers are capturing for their own uh, uh, foiling. So the Nigerian police must eradicate such kind of behavior from the top level, not from the middle level, because all these are problems from the top level. You know, part, so, of, part of what I see, and you may disagree with me, is that um, I think most of these people are socially isolated. And they also go through chronic stress, which I think disengages them from the realities of life. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree so with you. Yeah, what, because do you. Don't you think there should be a lot should be done yeah, yeah. to help them I, I, in their social I still, life? I still try to understand why uh, the government are not setting up uh, some committee to oversee uh, the welfare of the Nigerian police. When you go to Ikeja, for example, uh, the police barrack opposite Area F, uh, you can't put a British dog to live there. The British dog will die before seven days. The place is so messed up. The building is looking like a building that want to collapse. And most of these police people that are serving this country and protecting the territorial integrity of this great nation stays in private apartments, stays in a, in a, a in self rented apartment with their own funds. Because this chronic stress leads them to alcohol dependency. Quite a number of people, we've seen a lot of videos that you see them yeah, and most times when yeah, they are happy, trigger happy, yeah. they are usually at that drunk state. Yeah. Okay. But I think we should rest the police case for, for now because we would really like to hear your two cents on the terrorism attack in okay. the northeast since you have been in the military front. What do you think would be the best strategy? Because we're seeing that now the borders that are short, you know, how can we, you know, take advantage of the situation and truly curb or probably eradicate um, the Boko Haram insurgency? 
Uh, first of all, the Nigerian government needs to bring the, uh, conflict entrepreneurs into uh, uh, accountability or warlordism, you understand? Because uh, uh, this war has lasted over 10 years. And uh, one of the greatest funding, uh, one of the greatest uh, items to fund is war. You can't fund a war for 10 years. The arms and ammunition are very expensive. The weaponry the Boko Haram are using are very expensive. That means there are some people that are sabotaging the effort of this great nation. Now, let's come back home now. Looking at Nigeria, for example, Nigeria is a country that is being covered by about five countries. And the five nations that surround all, all Francophone speaking country. When you go to Nigeria from the southeast, we are bordered by Cameroon, we are bordered by Niger Republic, we are bordered by uh, uh, Chad Republic, and we are also bordered by Benin. These five countries that surround all our Francophone, we are only the English speaking country. That is a natural threat on its own, geographical threat. But adventure uh, Third World War sprang up during the United States and Iran uh, opera. Uh, are you telling me these five countries will be our allies? No, they won't be our allies. There's power in language. Now, what the Nigerian government needs to us to do is that they need to hold the military into account because uh, I have sent a lot of letters to the military authority. I have written a lot of articles. And it seems that the Nigerian army are not ready to listen because they are carrying out an intentional operational error every given day at time. Do you, you think their intelligence is a bit defective? Intelligence graduate? Okay, let me just uh, uh, wrap up with uh, what I'm saying so I don't forget what I'm saying. Okay. Now, looking at the, uh, the Nigerian Army operational methodology now, is that you don't leave a soldier for about nine years, or about nine, more, over nine months in the front line. The problem we're having is that you see some soldiers spending three years, four years in the front line. His mental well-being will depreciate. His psychological well-being will depreciate. His physical well-being will depreciate as well because you can't keep fighting the enemy for one, two, three, four years. Bring them back home to re reunite with their family. Some rejuvenate of them, and then yeah, rejuvenate and take them back because it's very, very uncomfortable for you to leave a soldier four years in the front line. That operation is going to fail because whenever Boko Haram comes, let me be very honest with you. At the mindset of every given soldier, when they hear Boko Haram, they are scared because Boko Haram has two operational strategies. Hmm. They have the uh, 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 political strategy and they have their uh, field operational strategy. What do you mean political their, strategy? Yes, yeah, their political strategy is the sense that they try to coerce the public, they also try to persuade and they also try to coerce. Now, their operational strategy is to instill fear on the security agencies, which they have succeeded. Boko Haram has succeeded in instilling fear into all our security agencies. And even the citizens as well. Oh, sure. And so, the truth, be, the truth be told, you know, the the best weapon in the war front is the mindset. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. Fear. When you can put fear into your enemy's mind, are you uh, defeat is imminent. So the best weapon in the mind in the war front is the mindset. The mindset is where the war begins. The mind is where the war begins because every human being will have two instinctive drive. We have the eros drive and the thanatos drive. The eros drive is classified as the god of love. Why the thanatos drive is classified as the god of death? Now, what the management of this process is what we call the thought process. Now, in the giving front line, if your drive is not of the heroes, that is, maybe you are not thinking positive, you are thinking negative, defeat is imminent. So our uh, uh, Nigerian uh, army needs to come back to the drawing board, pull out those soldiers, retrain some of these soldiers and take them back for us and, to succeed. And, and it, would it not be nice for them to just partner with people and genuinely partner with people that can help them and stop believing that they I'm know everything. Intelligent. When you say my partner with people that know, what do you mean by partner with no, people I'm, that know? I'm saying that there are people that are, they have high level of intelligence, but they are not in the military structure. So why can't you genuinely, honestly get intelligence outside of your military? Because most times I think they, only, they always want to solve the problem. They want Revenge. to be the one to say, okay, we solve the problem. Okay, I understand what you're trying to say. Yeah. I, that's why you have a very good okay. question and about intelligence. Question no, 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 we, we don't have time. Out time. <laughs> we have running out of time. Um, Amnesty International always accusing the military of human rights abusers. And this is directly linked to our access to sophisticated weapons. Because most of these in Western countries will not sell them to us because they are afraid that Nigerian military can abuse, um, can use it as a weapon to abuse civilians. citizens. Yeah. yeah. So, what do you think of this? Well, I'm, 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 say, I'm a senior member of Amnesty International. So why is it? Why? Why? why Human rights abuses. Why? Why is it so rampant? In the front line? Yes. Well, that will be left for the soldier because the soldiers in the front line are already provoked. Mm. Their mindset is already altered. They don't have a distinctive mindset of peace. They are in a war situation. They are in a, in a situation whereby they cannot manage their processes. Their thought process is defeated. So Amnesty International reserve the right to write whatever they want to write. But the soldiers are trying to clear the war, wrap it up, and come back and reunite with their family because they also have marital benefits. Some of them have not seen their wife for four years three years, two years, and so psychologically... Should that encourage, so and that should encourage human no, no, no. rights. Quickly, so you were talking about partnering with security out, um, intelligence 
other than within the military se sector? You wanted to quickly say Yeah, something. I want to say something. I think that was a question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you see, uh, one of the uh, reasons why we are losing this war as well is intelligence gathering. Uh, you can see a video that went viral by General uh, uh, Adeniyi that, that, that he was trying to pass a report to his commander. And uh, that video went viral. And I think the military, the military are trying to like uh, respond to that. Now, the reason why the video leaked is because I was not there. And I don't know the reason why it leaked. <laughs> but I think there was an error from the person that uh, took him that picture. Because I don't think the general with his capacity we want that video to leak because since that video leaked, the report is not made for his commander anymore. The report is made for every one of us. Wow. But he was trying to pass a report to his uh, commander, and the video got leaked. Now if you could see from his uh, a report from his uh, from the video, he's tense. He's not happy with the situation. He said that the system is working against them, which means they receive a wrong intelligence report, and that is why the military, the Nigerian army, needs to overhaul the Nigerian military intelligence Himself. because the yeah. military intelligence has failed the Nigerian army in, in a very countless, for, for, times. countless time. Thank you. Uh, Boko Haram are having sophisticated intelligence more than we. For Boko Haram to come and strike the Nigerian army, they go to they strike, they succeed. That is painful because they take, the war, they take the war to the military base. So the military must work in their intelligence gathering so that they will be able to contain this uh, uh, criminal elements. I think we can wrap it up there. Thank you so much. I mean, I think we need to bring you back because um, security would remain a challenge for a very, very long time. Oh, sure. It's not going to end in the near future, yeah. but we'd really love to have you back so that we can we can dissect other sectors. Because, because I we have need to no question. Yeah, and I also okay. want to con congratulate you guys. You know, uh, Plus TV uh, <laughs> is now on so JSTV for ah, eight. Yes, one of the happiest special <laughs> because this station is one of the best stations in the world. Wow! Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Did you hear that? We're the best station in the world. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Now you can watch a repeat broadcast on Mondays. Saturdays and Sundays at 3 p.m. It's been a very, very insightful conversation, power-packed conversation. Remember to watch the repeat tomorrow. Now, please keep a date on all our social media platforms as we continue to hear what you are saying. Now, in case you missed today's quote, here it is again. Our security must be threatened in order for us to appreciate it. Do you agree with that, Dixon? I disagree. You disagree? Really, disagree, really quickly, yeah. why? Yeah, the reason why I disagree is that we don't need to be threatened for us to uh, know our capacity. We need to be prepared because when disaster struck, the time to prepare has passed. Ah, okay, but it, it will help us to appreciate it, though. <laughs> <laughs> to appreciate security when your your you your security is is, um, is threatened. All right, so he disagrees. We'll bring him back to come and tell us why later. Yeah. All right, so enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, Lamy. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>